In today's episode, the R35. In the interwar period, France was making do with basically two kinds of tanks. The FT and its descendants, and the D1 and D2. The D1 was a little bit inadequately armored, the D2 was too heavy to perform the light tank role that the FT was performing. It really only existed as a backstop to the B1 program. There the situation remained until 1933 when Hotchkiss got a little bit bored of waiting for the French government to issue a set of requirements to replace the FT and it started its own program. This nudged the French Armaments Advisory Council into action. They issued a set of requirements. It was going to be a two-man tank, eight to ten kilometers an hour, three centimeters of armor, and a machine gun or two, and maybe a small caliber main gun. In effect, this was an FT replacement, a direct descendant. Renault came on board with the ZM prototype. However, the requirements were changing rapidly, more rapidly than Renault could keep up with. Testing with the French 25mm anti-tank gun indicated that perhaps 3 centimeters was too weak and you needed 4. However, Renault was either fixing bugs or improving the tank. It couldn't do both at the same time and eventually things came to a head with German rearmament and the decision was made to simply build the Renault as it worked as opposed to the Renault improved to the requirements. The hull consists of three major parts that have been bolted together, and as you can see it's got a very good slope at the front. The problem is that casting technology was still rather in its infancy at the time, and the armor wasn't what it should have been. Testing showed that it was vulnerable not only to 25mm anti-tank gun fire in places, some places you could punch through with 8mm AP. Components on the front, on the left hand side you start off with a rear view mirror. A neat feature you don't often see in tanks at the time. A little bit further inboard we have the siren, and then further forward of that we have a light with the sheltered housing for low vision. The asymmetric nature of the tank is visible. The driver is on the left hand side, the right hand side is the gearbox, which then connects forward to the steering system to the sprocket wheels at the front of the tank. As you come around to the side of the tank, we're going to start off with the sponson bin. Uh, it's a push button release system, a little bit unusual. It's not a huge bin, it's really just going to be some of the tools that you'd use to maintain the vehicle. Further forward you'll see the marker lights, which seem to be relatively common on French tanks at the time. They're amber at the front, red at the rear, and they'll basically simply at night mark out the outside edges of the tank. Moving further down to the running gear, it is basically a development of the AMR 35 light tank that Renault had been building previously. It has two bogies, each with a single pair of road wheels, a sort of a horseman suspension system. Further forward, it has, I guess I'll call it a half bogey. It's a simple single wheel on a bell crank. The tracks are single pin, very short pitch with guide horns on the outsides. To change out the track pin, they're held in place by a little plug. Uh, you knock out the plug and then you can have the pin come out on the other end. That's it for the side, next to back. As you can expect with a tank this small, trench crossing capability was considered to be a bit of a problem. The solution was the same as its predecessor tank, the FT. They added a tail to many of these little Renaults in order to get across a longer gap. If it had a tail, the spare wheel would be mounted on the tail instead of on the back door here. The exhaust you can see comes out the back of the tank, comes around to the left, forward to the muffler and then back out again. Behind the two doors, which were already unbolted, you're going to see the engine on one side and the cooling system is on the other. The engine is a 5.9 liter four cylinder, puts out about 85 horsepower, gets the tank to about 20 kilometers an hour. Not exactly blinding speed, but this was an infantry tank. It wasn't really supposed to go much faster than the infantry it was supporting in the first place. You can also see an interesting feature here is for the hand crank where it meshes in to the crankshaft down here through this little port. On the left hand side you're going to see the belts which drive the radiator fan. It's a water cooled system. 
And here we have one of the wrenches used in the track tensioning system, which is underneath here. Pull out a cotter pin, undo this retaining bolt. It loosens up the teeth, which are here, and that allows you to then adjust the tension by use of this bolt down here. When you're done, obviously, reverse the process, off you go. Two ports on the left-hand side on the rear deck. The first one here is a fuel filler cap. It is a self-sealing tank, 166 liters. Gets the vehicle all of about 80 kilometers of range. Not fantastic. Further forward is the cap for the radiator. Nothing particularly dramatic about that. Insert coolant here. The third is a standard one, it's the APXR, and it is in common with the Hotchkiss of the same era. It has a couple of significant features. The first is the lack of a turret door. The way in and out is this little thing at the back here upon which I am seated. Uh, the other significant feature is the cupola, the little dome at the top, which is completely inexplicable to me, and I don't know what they were thinking. It does rotate so that your single little vision slit can see whatever it is that you want to see within limits. The poor man is stupidly overworked. The merits, or lack of merits, of the one-man turret are long debated. Uh, suffice to say, it does have the advantages of being small, hard to hit, well armored for the weight, and if you wanted it to, it could fit on an FT or a D1 or something like that. And that about ends the list of merits. Communication is not a problem, because there isn't any. Uh, if you are not the command tank, good luck trying to see what your commander is trying to tell you through either that little slit at the front or maybe on the sides of the turret. Uh, and if you were lucky enough to have a radio, which was not common at all, the ER-54 would be down in the hull in the stowage bin. The gun is a 37mm SA-18 and it was chosen primarily for economic reasons. Firstly, there was a whole lot of ammunition already sitting around French storerooms. Secondly, even a lot of the guns didn't need to be built. You simply take them off the old Renault FT tanks that are being decommissioned and mount them straight onto the new turret. In terms of capability, the 37 perhaps left something to be desired. Now, the high explosive round could be compared unfavorably to an M203 40mm grenade launcher like you might find underneath a rifle today, and the armor-piercing round was even worse. It did about 2 centimeters. Famously enough, a few vehicles got upgunned with a longer-barreled SA-38 gun. This added a complete additional centimeter of penetration, bringing you up to three, which quite frankly is pathetic. The remainder of the offensive firepower was conducted by use of the 7.5mm machine gun. Ammunition capacity in total was about 2400 rounds of drum magazines for the 7.5, and about 100 rounds for the 37. Because the AP round was so terrible, they didn't really carry many, and the vast majority, maybe 80%, was high explosive. There seems to have been little practical standardization on tactical markings. Prior to September 39, it was common. The battalion within each regiment, or two battalions, was determined by the color, blue or red. The company was determined by the card suit, and the platoon was determined by a background shape, either a circle, a square, or a triangle. Afterwards, there was a change. Companies now would be determined by the color, the platoons by the card suit, although a company commander would have all four suits painted on the side of his tank. There was one unit, the 23rd BCC, that said to heck with it all, and simply invented its own system of lines and Vs, and even to this day, nobody's ever been able to decipher it. Inside, I am trying to think of the correct superlative to describe the ergonomics of this fighting position. I am torn. I don't know if it's atrocious, god-awful, or horrendous, but suffice to say, this is a death trap. So, my first problem was simply getting in through the hatch at the back, and this locking lever, which is supposed to lock the hatch in place, of course, will dangle right down, and uh, let's just say the family jewels are in danger as I came in. Having successfully negotiated this obstacle, the next problem was 
the fixed recoil guard. In fact, it, it double purpose. It's not just a recoil guard, it is also the system for aiming. Uh, this does not move out of the way or anything. The best you can do is up or down. And that was the next obstacle for the various parts of my anatomy to avoid. Once I came down in, there is no seat. I'm seated on some component of the engine which I'm probably not supposed to be seated on. Uh, the closest thing he has is a sling. There's attachment points on each side for a leather sling which could be used. Um, yeah, I don't know if you would or not. The rest of the controls, well, he does have a regular hand traverse on the left, nothing too astonishing there. The elevation is controlled. We saw this before with Matilda. Uh, it's two hand grips with a trigger on the right hand side and a shoulder mount for elevation. The sight is mounted to the left and the 7.5mm machine gun is mounted on the right. The vision dome on the top, um, in order to rotate it because there's no handles or anything, he actually has to use his head. His helmet will mesh up with this dome and he can look around using that. Uh, I don't know what they were thinking. They're obviously trying to do things on the cheap, but still, I don't know what they were thinking. Uh, suffice to say, um, my feet are well up on the floor. On the right hand side is the power shaft directly behind me without a firewall, although I don't know if there is supposed to be one or not, um, is the engine bay. Uh, this is a runner, so they may not uh, just have it installed for maintenance purposes. Ammunition will be stowed on the right and the left. It will be stowed angled on the right and vertical on the left. Uh, outside of that, he's got a couple of vision uh, slits on the sides. There used to be originally dirt scopes in the original, you know, say, 50 or 100 vehicles, and then they changed to the more traditional vision slits. And that's all I'm going to say for this. It's, um, God help any tank commander, let alone any officer who's in here trying to control the tank. Oh, by the way, there's no intercom. You're used to using physical contact to direct your driver. Try to see where you're going, grab ammunition from down front, load it into the tube, aim it, fire the coax, and and try to avoid running into holes in the battlefield. I have no words. I'm going to sit in the driver's seat. Now I move forward from the commander's position to the somewhat more luxurious driver's position. That's a somewhat, it's a relative term. I am seated on a cushion on the whole floor, and thus my feet are about as high as my posterior is. Even at that, my knees barely clear the front panel. This is a two-piece hatch, and you can see how reassuringly thick this is with the, uh, at least it's a reasonable slope. Now, of course, the upper visor is supposed to come down. It's held in place by a little friction lock here. You unscrew this, you pull down on this, and you pull... That's the idea. However, I suspect nobody has been crazy enough to try to drive this vehicle in the last 70 years with the visor down. It seems to be stuck in place. If that lack of visibility wasn't enough, and you felt you wanted even less, what you could do is you could block up your vision ports, one on each side. So you're just stuck now with the one direct forward. I I got nothing. The three pedals are as you would expect. The clutch is on the left, the brake is in the middle, and the accelerator is on the right. And the brake activates a single brake band, which appears to be leather. And it's uh, the reason I can tell this is that the brake itself, it's approximately six inches to my right of my foot. The power shaft comes all the way from the gearbox just behind the turret forward to the brake and then into the steering system uh, front and right. The gearbox itself is a four speed, so reverse forward, first back, second, third and fourth. And the steering is conducted by use of these two horizontal grip tillers. And I don't like these for two reasons. Firstly, it it's going to get in the way of your legs. Secondly, I just naturally prefer a vertical tiller instead of a horizontal one. And given how many vehicles later in life had vertical tillers, I suspect I was not the only person to come to that conclusion. 
really isn't very much else to say about the driver's compartment. Um, all in all, I think this tank is not one that you would want to get shot at in, and even worse, one that you would have to get out of in a hurry. Uh, there's no spring loading on this. Uh, it's I had to have help just to close it. Uh, I got nothing. Um, I'm gonna get out. A number of versions of the R35 were made, varying from mine clearers to fascine carriers. There was one combat development, the R40. This was an elongated chassis, had a raised idler, and a new suspension designed by APX. There was something of a throwback. It consisted of vertically sprung multiple subcomponent bogies. About 130 of these were made. Production of the R35 itself in total is, like other French tanks that were being produced as fast as possible, a little bit uncertain. 975 or so were delivered to the French army by the start of the war. This consisted of 21 51 tank battalions, plus an additional number in training and maintenance, reserve and so on, plus 40 or 45 that were serving overseas. In addition, about 200 had been created for the export market, and they saw service with Poland, Yugoslavia, Turkey, and Romania. The Germans and Italians, of course, like any other tank that they captured, pressed it into service themselves. And curiously, they had some of the most successful results in the Balkans. The reason being that this was somewhat mountainous terrain, and these diminutive little vehicles were able to get up the small trails and they were sufficiently well armored to be able to deal with pretty much anything that could be manhandled up those hills. The tank did continue to see service with the Free French and Vichy French, not in that order, in North Africa and Syria, and some of the Syrian examples indeed were captured and used by the Australians. Overall, the tank cannot really be considered an astounding success. Now bear in mind, part of the problem was just the way it was used. This was an infantry support tank. It was parceled out, it was designed to be a supporting effort, not a primary punch in itself. Now, for what the French were trying to build by the doctrine, this actually did pretty well. The problem was that the French were building for the wrong kind of war. That was the R35, and we'll be back in some more for the next one. See you then.